1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And while you're turning here, let's give God praise for First Lady and Vince Ryan. Amen. Ryan, some of beautiful song. Say yes. Say yes. Whenever God asks us to do something, our answer should be yes. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And we're going to be looking at it from uh, a few different translations this morning to make sure this word sticks in our spirit. From the King James Version. Now, I love the King James, I love the King James Version. It sounds so good. Uh, it says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. From the NIV, uh, better understood, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. From the message uh, translation, but you are the ones chosen by God Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him. To tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. And God's word translation. However, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people who belong to God. You were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his holy word. And just for a short while, we want to speak from this thought. Perception. Somebody say perception. Perception. Amen. Perception. And for a subtitle, how do you see yourself? Look at somebody and ask, how do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? Amen. Now, a lot of people uh, would like to, to think that the way we see ourselves can either be negative or positive. There are those who have the train of thought that it's good that we have the correct perception of ourselves. Because if we don't have the correct perception of ourselves, then we can be misled or led astray by anything that looks like the direction we're going. So we need to be able to have the correct perception so that we can see clearly where God is taking us. Conversely, on the other hand, there are people who think, well, you don't need to see yourself clearly because what it is is going to be, um, you don't have to have direction. You just walk through life, status quo, let the rain fall where it may, and just live life by the seat of your pants. And the people that say that more than likely don't have to struggle with skin color. All right. The people who live in that second camp uh, no doubt don't have the struggles that other people face because they had privilege when others have not had that privilege. And so, especially if we talk uh, to color, people of color, we must understand that perception is valuable. It is invaluable. It's, it's, it's something that must be addressed because if we don't see ourselves correctly, then we'll fall for anything. If we don't see ourselves the way that we're supposed to see ourselves, then anything can come to us and we'll accept it. We'll accept anything that comes because we're seeking identity because we don't have a clear perception of who we are. So because we don't see ourselves correctly, we'll accept anything into our lives that will degrade us, that will tear us down, that will move us away from our destiny. And what God is saying is when we look at ourselves, we should never see ourselves through our own eyes. 
We should never see ourselves through our own eyes, but we should see ourselves through his eyes. All right. What does God say about us? Because what he says about us can change our lives. You know, what we say about ourselves, we can pump ourselves up and, you know, we can you know, say good things about ourselves and we can uh, pat ourselves on the back and none of it can be true. We can be living a falsehood. And even when we pat ourselves on the back and say things about us that are true, it may not come to pass because that's not God's mission or goal for us. That's what we want for ourselves. It's important that we see things through God's eyes. Why is it so important? Well, just to give up um, uh, uh, an example, we all know about uh, vehicles, right? Uh, there's a, well, one brand of vehicles, Ford, and we know that Ford's high-end market, anybody know what, what, what the maker, the name of the high-end market for Ford's are? Link, who said it? Brian, it, excellent. So, perception, is critical if we're talking about vehicles. And if we're talking about vehicles and perception is critical, how much more is it critical when we talk about us? For instance, how many of you like this, um, this black on black, this chrome on black uh, navigator? Doesn't that look nice? Yes. How many of you would want that? Uh, amen. And that's a Ford. That's Ford's high end, okay? But now, Ford also made another vehicle, which is called the. Uh, <laughs> anybody know what that is? A oh, I know that's a, that's a pacer. Hatchback. <laughs> Perception is so critical because we may be walking around with a Ford mentality of a pacer, but God has placed in us a navigator engine. Come on, all right, come on now. And if we are putting around in a pacer vehicle when God's placed a navigator engine in us, we're not going to be happy. Nobody we touch is going to be happy because we're not operating on the level that God has called us to operate. Now, please hear me well. If God called you to be a pacer, then you be the best pacer that you can possibly. There's nothing wrong with being a pacer. If God called you to be a pacer, but if God calls you to be a navigator, right. and you have a pacer mentality, something is wrong. Yeah. God is saying he wants us to operate on the level that he's calling us to. And the problem is, some of us have been called to a navigator spiritual dwelling place, but then we have to revert back to a pacer lifestyle because the vision has not yet come to pass. And we have to keep driving the pacer until we get to the next vehicle. Let's see what's forward as a... Then we start driving the Taurus. You know, we got to move from the Ford pacer to the Ford Taurus. And then we drive from the Ford Taurus into... Give me another vehicle between the Taurus and the Navigator. Bronco. Bronco. Then, then we move from the Taurus into the Bronco. And then finally, we can move into the Navigator. And many of us, we kick the pacer, we kick the Taurus, we kick the Bronco, but we don't understand that the process is just as important as the destination. The path we travel, the, the process, the, the journey is just as important as the destination. Because on the journey, we learn that the pacer, I can't put my big self in that thing. It's going to be uncomfortable. I can't carry stuff in. So while I'm scrunched up, I go, oh, God. I feel for people who, who have these small vehicles. So then when we get the navigator and we see somebody who needs a ride, we don't have our nose stuck up in the air because we can give somebody a ride and a navigator. Right. Every blessing that God blesses us with is not for us. Right. Every blessing he gives us is not for us. Sometimes God will bless you because he knows you're going to bless somebody else. Amen. He wants us to understand that we need to operate on the level in which we're called. So as we take a look at this text, as we, as we take a look, we find here that the Apostle Peter is trying to get the church. He's writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. So he's writing to them, trying to get them to understand perception, how you see yourself. And he starts off here, I draw your attention to the very first few verses. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 
Peter says, therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit. See, there are some things in us that we perceive about ourselves that uh, cause us to live with skeletons in the closet. We've got some skeletons in the closet, and those skeletons have caused us to live a life of malice and deceit. And God is calling us to get rid of those things. Rid yourself of them. Now notice, Peter is telling the church that they need to rid themselves of it. Many of us, in order to rid ourselves of these things, we go to God and say, God, I need your help to get, to get out of this. I need your help to deliver me from that. Lord, deliver me. Yes, we to go to God and ask him for deliverance. But what part do we play? Right. We want God to do everything, but we don't want to do anything. God, I want you to deliver me, so while I'm waiting for you to deliver me, I'm going to keep doing what I used to do and hope I don't get caught up and I wait for you. God, no, there's a part that God will play, and there's a part that we must play. God wants us to have an active role in what, we're, in what he wants to do for us. Malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Peter said, get rid of those things. Many of us can't be blessed because we're holding on to baggage that's keeping us bound. Many of us can't be blessed because we're holding on to baggage that's keeping us bound. Many of us can't be blessed because we're holding on to baggage that's keeping us bound. God can't get any blessings in us because we got all this other stuff. He wants us to get rid of the balance, get rid of the envy, get rid of the jealousy, get rid of all this stuff so that he can fill us with some blessings. Verse 2, like newborn babes crave spiritual milk. Anybody a, a new mother? I guess a new mother. New grandma. When, when your grandchildren were born, they have a natural inclination to latch on and to suck, to eat. Because while they were in mama, they got fed a different kind of way. And then God moved them from that system into another system. So now they're looking for something else. And they, they have a natural inclination to latch on to something. God wants to know, are we latching on to his word? All right. Are we latching on to his word or are we latching on to something else? No matter what, we're, we're latching on to something. The world is competing for our attention. We have so many voices going on in our head. I'm not talking about schizophrenia. But there are so many things that are competing for our attention. What are we latching on to? What are we holding on to? God is saying, I want you to hold on to my word because I want you to desire my word like an infant desires milk. If an infant doesn't get fed milk, they will die because they, they need that nourishment. God wants us to be that hungry for the word. He wants us to be hungry for the milk of the word. Now, once we get the milk of the word, that's a good starting point. All right. Amen. All right. How, what would it look like if I came in here with a baby bottle and I was still, well, let me go back a little further. What would it look like if my mama was in here and I'm a grown, I ain't gonna go this I won't do it. Okay. Never mind. Just let me shake your hands and I'm good. Okay. I ain't gonna do that. But we'll stick with the bottle. What would it look like if I had a bottle and I came in here drinking a bottle? That's not gonna nourish me. As we grow older, physically, we desire physical food that will sustain us. As we grow spiritually, we need some spiritual food that will sustain us. Yeah. We can't live on milk. We got to get to the meat of the word. Yes. We have to desire it. So that by it, you may grow up in your salvation. Look at somebody, and be careful how you say this. Tell somebody to grow up. Grow up. Grow up. Amen. Grow up. grow up. Many of us have been Christians for far too long, and we're still sucking on spiritual pacifiers. Still sucking on spiritual bottles. God wants us to grow up and get some meat. Amen. Amen. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Mm, now that you have tasted. Anybody ever tried God and found him to be a friend? Found him to be a provider? Found him to be a strong child? Found him to be whatever you need it? Anybody ever tried him? And after you found that out. I don't need the Lord. I'm done. I'm done with that. No, once you have tasted the goodness of God, why would you ever turn away from that? Once you've tasted how good God is, why would you ever forsake that? God is I want more. I want a relationship with you, and I'm hoping 
God and say, I want you to have, want a relationship with me. We ought to want what God wants for us more than what we want for ourselves. Amen. The living stone, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone. Who's the living stone? Jesus is the living stone. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God. See, the world looked at Jesus and said, oh, nah, he's not a suitable savior. He was smitten, stricken of God, slowed and afflicted. He's not worthy. But what people reject and look over, God looks at. God is saying because Jesus was rejected uh, and he was the head of the corner, he was the cornerstone, and people rejected him. The same people who rejected him are now tripping over him because he's become an offense to them that they can't go around, they can't get over him, they can't get under him. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. We can bow now or we can bow later, but we are going to bow. You might as well bow now. Yes. Bow now, simple Lord, I, I surrender. Lord, I know you're in control. Yes. I know you own everything. I'm going to, Lord, give it all to you. And so Lord, I bow now because I don't want to wait until later and have to bow and be told, depart from me. Work of iniquity. As you come to the living stone, rejected by him, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, you also, like living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Look at what God thinks about us. So we, we, we've seen what we think about ourselves sometimes. We've got this malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy. But look at what God thinks about us. He says you are living stones. We're made in the image of him. We're living stones built into spiritual houses. We are a priesthood. We are a priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay in Zion a chosen precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now when we talk about cornerstone, for those of you who have done some building, you know that, uh, especially back in, in, back in the day, they would use this cornerstone and it was uh, bricks that they would put to mark uh, the, the, the foundation of the building. And everything that's connected to build that building erect so they could go above the ground was connected to the cornerstone. And if it's not connected to the cornerstone, then it's not a sure foundation. And what God is saying to us is that Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. And we need to be connected to him. Because if we're going to build something on top, it needs to be founded on a sure foundation. And Jesus Christ is that sure foundation. He's that rock on which we are founded. And a stone, the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So this passage of scripture talks about some destiny. So there are those who are destined to be a part of the cornerstone, and then there are those who are destined to reject the cornerstone. And this is a good point, a good place to tell the, the house, you all know this, but if we don't accept Jesus, then that means we reject him. And if we don't accept him, meaning we reject him, there is only one place for us to spend eternity. Yes, yes. Now, check this out. Jesus, God, never made hell for humanity. He never created hell for humans. The word of God says that hell was created for the demons, for the devil and, his, and the demonic spirits. So wait a minute, so then, well then how do we, for those who don't accept Christ, why don't we go to hell? Because we can't go to heaven. And there's no other place for us to go. So why would we spend eternity in a place that was never created for us? Yeah. And the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. Amen. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. Don't care what our sins are, what we've done wrong, the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. We all have done things in the wrong. We've all done, we've all committed sin. My sin may not be your sin. Your sin may not be somebody else's sin, but all of us have sinned. Look at somebody say, you've been sin. You've been sin. You've sin. 
I sin. We all have sin and fallen short of God's glory. But thank God for Jesus because he says that I made a way for you yeah. not to have to suffer what your penalty deserving of. Yeah. I made a way by giving my son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. You don't have to spend eternity in hell. We can spend eternity with God because we trust in him when his son Jesus did. Brings us to our text. I want us to just take a look at this photo. And I want you to, to take a look at it, and I want you to tell me what you see. I'm hoping that you see at least two women. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. There's two women in there. There's two of them. I don't see eight. Okay. So uh, the, the, let me say this. If our physical eyes have a, a, a hard time to see or you know, if our physical eyes have a hard time understanding what we're seeing physically, how much more is going on spiritually that we can't see? Uh -huh. The point to be made here is if our physical eyes can't see that there's two women in there, what's going on spiritually that we may have fallen prey to because we don't see clearly? There, there are two women in there. There's two women. Um, there's an old woman and a young woman. Yeah. I'm going to have to try and get this out here. Okay, so here is the, the, the chin bone, the, the chin structure of the young woman. And here's her neck. You see her neck? There's her, her face. There's her nose. You see her nose? There's her eyes. And that's her hair or whatever garment or whatever she's wearing. You see, you see the young woman? Yes. And that's her necklace. Yes. Okay, now the older woman, this is the older woman's nose. You see her? That's her nose. And this is her mouth. And this is her whole, let me see, I've been lost in myself. Uh, okay, so the older woman, that's her face. So this is the older, this is the nose of the woman. Can you see it now? That's the nose of the older woman. And she's got something, she's got hair. This is the older woman's hair. There's something over her face. Y'all see it now? Yeah. Okay. If we are looking with our spiritual, with our physical eyes, and have a hard time telling what that is. What's going on spiritually? And this is why God wants us to get to the point of impartation, where, uh, let me tell you the story, you can understand it better. Um, Jesus asked his disciples, he said, uh, tell me who, who do people say that I am? And his disciples began to tell Jesus, well, Jesus, some people think you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elias, some say you're one of the prophets, or, or a good, good man, a good teacher. And then Jesus got downright indignant. He said, well, who do you say that I am? He got personal. Right. And each of us has to know who Jesus is for ourselves. Yeah. And Peter, being the bold disciple, he says, you are the living God, the, you are the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah. You're the one who takes it. And Jesus told him, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my Father, which is in heaven, we have to get to impartation where we're getting information from God through spiritual sources and not physical sources. We don't ask me how to do it because I'm still working on myself. But we, God wants to transcend us from just physical senses to spiritual senses. Because when we operate in spirit, the, the flesh can't touch God. The flesh, can't, the flesh can't move God. God operates by faith. The word of God says that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, you can't touch spirit. You can't touch truth. So how do you worship him? On a spiritual level. How do you get there? Well, the, I'm going to try to explain the best way I can. The way God has created the body is phenomenal. Even though we are a we are a spirit, we're a spirit, we live in a body, and we have a soul. We are made in the image of God. God is a three-part being as well. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're made in His image, so we too are three parts, mind, body, and spirit. So 
the way God works is all three connect. So what I do in my flesh affects my spirit and my soul. What I do spiritually affects my soul and my body. We have to get to the point where the spirit transcends everything else. And the way we do that is operating in flesh, but somehow God will turn our operation in the flesh and uh, conceptualize it spiritually. So flesh, we read the Bible. Flesh, we pray. Flesh, we do God's work. And somehow God translates that into spiritual things. So we must continue to do what's, what's, what's physical, but do it on a different level. Can, can you understand that? We must continue to do what's physical, but transcend it to a spiritual level so that we can meet with God. Because God doesn't deal with flesh. God deals with spirit. And we need to begin to operate in spiritual things. So when I get more information, I'll give it to you. Amen. So what, what Paul, what Peter is saying here is that if we can't tell naturally on earth what's going on, then how can we definitely see what's going on spiritually? And so he wants us to understand the way God sees us. Because the way God sees us plays a very important role on how we act. Um, remember when we were children? I know some of us have to go back a little further than others. But remember when we were children, how we used to crave the attention of our parents or our, our moms and dads. We wanted, to, we wanted to please them. So we would, you know, if you were a good, halfway decent child, you would try to please mom and daddy. You would, you know, they tell you to do something, you would cut the grass, you would wash the dishes, or whatever it was, because you wanted to please them. Well, God wants us to please him. And it says here that uh, our perception, when we try to please God, God will help us to see ourselves the way he sees us. And when we see ourselves the way God sees us, that will change the way we act. That will change our behavior. It will change our lifestyle. It will change everything because now we have the approval of daddy. We have the approval of our father. But we are, this is the way God sees us. He told Peter to write this. He, he gave Peter inspiration to write this. God sees us as a, as a chosen generation. God chose us. He chose us. Out of all the people in the world he could have chose, he chose you. He chose me. God knows the, the beginning from the end. When we talk about predestination and uh, determination. God knows who was going to accept him and who wasn't going to accept him. God knew that you would accept him. And because he knew you would accept him, he chose you before you even had a chance to accept him. He knew you would accept him, so he chose you before you had a chance to accept him because he knew you would choose him. God chose us. He chose us to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his voice, to be his heart. Are we using what he chose to do his will? A royal, he calls us royal. We are a royal priesthood. What's a priest do? A priest offers sacrifices to atone for people's sin. That's what they did in the Old Testament. God says now that Jesus has come, when he died on the cross, it said the, uh, the, the, the uh, curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, symbolizing that nobody could have done it but God. God tore the curtain to symbolize that we no longer have to go to the priest to get uh, access to God. But he says, we are priests. We have access to God. We have access to God. We have access to him. Yeah. Holy nation. God wants to set us apart for his specific use. That's what holy means. How can we win the world for Christ when we act in the world? Come on, guys. How can we uh, tell somebody else, oh, God will save you from that addiction, but we're addicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, God wants us to operate where we are, but he says, clean yourself. I, I want to help clean you up. I want you to be a holy nation. I want you to be a holy. Separate yourself. Not isolation, but insulation. God doesn't want us to be isolated from people, but he wants us to be insulated in him. So that when we get around people who are uh, different from us, who are, you know, uh, who are trying to lead to Christ, that they don't contaminate us and drag us away but we infect them and drag them to God. Yes. A holy nation, a peculiar people. God made us peculiar. And 
thing that's the world is trying to infiltrate the church. We as peculiar people are trying to fit in with the world. And we wonder why we don't fit. We wonder why uh, we're trying to put a, a square peg in a triangle hole. We're not made to fit. God doesn't want us to fit in. He made us peculiar. We're different. So when people see, what, what is it about you? That's your opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. What? You're going, you're going through the same thing I'm going through, but yet I see you have a smile on your face. That's your opportunity to declare the goodness of God. Who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we should show forth his praise. So, in light of God calling us a chosen generation, we're royal and we're priests, and we're a holy nation, and we are peculiar people, what should our response be to all that God has done for us? Well, it's right here in the text. It says that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because God has done all that for us, the least we can do is praise him. The least we can do is praise him. And to tell others, uh, we, we sometimes we make witnessing too complicated. We want to, you know, give the, the, the five point step, the three point step, the seven point step to how, how to witness. How do you witness? To witness effectively? You want to know how to witness effectively? Tell somebody your story. Amen. Tell somebody what Jesus did for you. Yes. That's witnessing. Tell somebody how God brought you out. Tell somebody how God delivered you. Tell somebody about how there was no way, but God made a way out of no way. Tell somebody about that. That should be our response. And God says if we do those things, he's going to help us to see ourselves the way he sees us. And when we see ourselves the way God sees us, it'll change the way we live. Perception. How do you see yourself? Hey. Lord, we, thank you. we thank you, Lord, that you see us in your light. We thank you, Lord, that you see us not as we are, but how we can be. We thank you, Lord, for potential. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of darkness into marvelous light. We thank you, Lord, that you work with us even uh, while we're going through what we're going through, trying to get to the light. We thank you, Lord, for the process and we trust you. We ask you now, Lord, to help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask God, I'm going to ask First Lady to come with our invitation. Amen, amen. Perception. That is more than half of the battle. When you're going to take a test or you're going to face with something, how do you perceive the outcome? Do you see yourself as a victor? Do you see yourself succeeding? Perception. Today we have um, offered a plea, what we call opening the doors of the church. And that is for anyone who'd like to come um, be a part of Gospel Christian Fellowship, whether it be on your Christian experience, whether it be as a new comfort to Christ through baptism. Maybe someone needs just um, to be under watch care while they're going from one place to another. So we open the doors of the church for anyone now who would like to come to be a part of Gospel Christian Fellowship. Our second plea is for anyone who would like to be baptized. Um, Maybe you don't know God and pardon of your sins, and it looks like everyone here has confessed Christ. But maybe you want to recommit yourselves. Amen. Is, he, he talked uh, yesterday, and he'd like to be baptized. So we're just going to, um, do we have him come up, Pastor? Yeah. Um, yeah. Make it formal. We want to embarrass you a little bit and come on up with Dennis. Yes. We thank God for Brother Dennis. Are there any others who would like to be baptized? Any others? Come as a new convert or as a rededication. Yes. Brother Dennis, uh, we know that you want to be baptized and we are so glad that you have already come into the house. You're already working. 
and we are just going to trust God. I know you shared with us that you want to be baptized on a day when you can have your son come with you. So we definitely will honor that. Anything you'd like to say to us? Thank you. Amen. Amen. We know you want to be baptized. Did you, we're not going to put any pressure on you. Did you also want to become a part of this fellowship? Yeah. Uh, to, to become a part of our, not a member, but a disciple of Christ here at God's Will for Fellowship? Yes. Amen. 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 We will have your information with us. We got your information, so thank you. You can uh, go back to the camp. <laughs> Let there be healing yeah. 
in the house, Lord. For you said this is a house of prayer. So we're coming to you with prayer requests. Lord, you know the names, you know the persons, you know the situation, you know the issues. We're asking, Lord, that you bless right now the trainer family. Bless Brother Al. Bless Brother Dennis as he's coming in to be baptized and connect with you, Lord. Enrich his relationship with you. We ask now that you uh, bless the Portee family and bless the Guyton and the Guyton family, Lord. We ask that you bless Reverend Woody, Lord, and bless Reverend Tony Snell, Lord. Please bless the Chambers family as they're bereaved right now, Lord. Touch as only you know how. Plus, bless the Briggs family, Lord, and touch them and comfort them as you, as you know how, Lord. Lord, there have been many prayer requests. Charge it to my head, Lord, and not my heart. For I come to you with those requests. And we cast our cares upon you, Lord, because you cared for us. But many years ago, you went to the cross of Calvary, and you shed your blood that we may be redeemed unto you. And when you shed your blood, Lord, you promised us that we would have a comforter, a paraclete, someone to walk with us through this journey. So we're asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit come and dispense your comfort right now. Dispense your direction right now. Dispense your healing power right now, Lord. Somebody's confused in their mind and don't know which way to go, Lord. But we know that you are the way, the truth, and the light. We ask that you shine bright before them right now, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you bless the situation on I-70, the accident that happened, Lord. May that family come to know you in the part of their sins. And if they know you, Lord, help them to see you as a source. Oh, Lord, help them to see you as a source. Lord, thank you. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for God's Will Christian Fellowship. We thank you for the grant, Lord. And though we know the grant came through one avenue, we know that you are the source. And you have given us a resource to be a blessing to this community. We ask now, Lord, that you bless our efforts, bless our hands and our feet as we go out and meet the community, Lord. We ask that you bless every person in this sanctuary under the sound of my voice, under the sound of the airways, Lord, that they may come to know you in the part of their sins and that they may come to unite with you even closer, Lord. Let our relationship be rich with you, Lord, for you redeemed us for purpose. We ask, Lord, for clarity right now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord, for this is God's will, Christian fellowship, that we surrender right now to you, Lord, that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, the whole church said amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, First Lady. I meant to uh, add evangelist Perlene to that praise. Yes. We are going to appear under the hours of our spin. We're going to appear for our offering and um, benediction statements as expeditiously as we can. So if you are prepared to give, uh, just bring it on forward, please. Bring your offering forward. And if you would like to uh, read the benediction statement, you certainly can stay and do that as well. Thank you for every gift that you give. Thank you so much for every gift.
Lord, give me some honor. Give me a name. Praise the 